Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation and by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 188, March 18th, 2015. Valerie and Jerry report on Navasa. Good evening, everybody. It's Ham Nation time. I got a note from NT9E today. I, I get it every Wednesday and tells me it's Ham Nation time. So, Dave, thanks for sending that along. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I know he sends it to a lot of people. We're in the Ozarks tonight and um, have a really great show tonight. We've got guests from the Dayton Hamvention going to tell you about all the awards that's going to happen there. We're very excited to hear about that. It's always uh, kind of a secret thing, and we're, uh, we're kind of happy that they chose uh, Ham Nation each uh, year to, to let everybody know before the Ham Hamvention starts. But uh, before I get to on with the rest of the hosts and things, I have to tell you, get, get your pencil out or get your notepad out, whatever. Um, Leo Laporte has, he's launching the audience survey. They do this every year. And it kind of helps us know who's doing what, what you want, what you don't like, and so on. It really helps the programming here on Twit. And um, we need you to go in and take this audience survey. It's very, very important. Uh, Brian has put it up on the screen, and uh, uh, the if you're listening and uh, not watching right now, it's real simple. It's uh, twit.tv slash survey, twit.tv slash survey. Please do that for us, please. Uh, Leo would appreciate it, and it, it lets everybody at, at Twit know that uh, you're watching and what you want, so uh, please do that. I am joined tonight by some of our great hosts, and of course, one of them is the great teacher of amateur radio, Gordon West, WB6NOA. Gordo, how are you doing? Is it real hot in L.A. now? What's going on there? No, we have uh, thunder showers today, but uh, they're probably left over from a couple of weeks ago in Plano, but it didn't dampen the ham radio outlet Plano's get together, especially this coming Saturday. Guess who's going to show up, Bob, is Kevin Caramanos representing PowerWorks. And as you know, PowerWorks has a brand new radio that they're uh, presenting. And uh, these brand new radios uh, that you'll see this coming weekend are going to be very popular. So that's this Saturday, Ham Radio Outlet, Plano, Texas. Also in Texas, the Greater Houston Ham Fest in Brazos Valley, Amateur Radio Club, putting that one together. And then, Bob, way over in Europe, the U.K. says, don't forget about our Blackpool, Lancashire, Amateur Radio Rally scheduled for April 12th. So I don't know if I can make that one, but I'll be thinking about them. Back to you, Bob. We, we should do that sometime. We should just pack us all up, get Don and George and Valerie and Amanda, and uh, we'll leave out. I don't want to leave him by day. Everybody, Brian, let's take everybody and go to the UK. That'd be kind of fun to go over there. What, what we really need to do is take a cruise. You know that? I, really. I, and I'm serious about this. 
Anybody got any thoughts on that? Send me an email. You like to go on a cruise. We ought to, we ought to have a ham nation cruise. What a crazy idea. Oh, well, I, you guys all know I'm crazy anyway. But uh, <laughs> that would be kind of fun. What do you think, Gordo? Take a yeah. cruise with everybody? Wouldn't that be super? I'm for it. Let's do it. We're on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. I might have started something. That's okay. Let's finish it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Let me know. You want to go? You want to go? <laughs> we could do that. Um, I, I want to let you know that uh, the bands have not been very good. And uh, boy, do we have a report tonight. Do not leave your computer. Do not oh, turn yeah. off any of your devices because Don's got the lady. And uh, it's going to be a real special thing tonight. And she'll tell you what happened and what's going on. And if you missed it yesterday, the bands were totally dead. But Last night, six meters opened, uh, 75 meters was long skip, and it's, it, oh, it's so much fun. But that's what makes ham radio so great is, you know, people say, well, I could get on the Internet and I could keep email you. Yeah, but you couldn't, you'd always have that happening. You got all this stuff. You never know where your signal's going. And boy, it was <laughs> fun yesterday. Let me tell you. Oh, boy. Gordo, what was happening out there? Let us know what's going on. I think you got some news here. Uh, we do, and we got some short shots in just a moment about antennas. But uh, let me tell you, things were very strange two days ago when the bands were dead. And then today, six meters opened to South America. Well, it takes a good antenna mobile to be able to work uh, some HFDX. So let's go ahead and roll the short shots and take a look at HF mobile. And um, HF mobile, we encourage all of you is get your antenna feed point up as high as at least the glass. If you don't get it up any higher, you're going to lose a lot of your radiation into the side of your vehicle and it introduces unwanted capacitance that will screw up the feed point impedance. Now this is a nice setup, but notice they've actually grounded the top part of that mount just to bring the impedance back up to 50 ohms. Magnetic mount, high frequency, maybe, but likely maybe not. You've got to have a good contact to the ground plane below. And um, uh, this is a good installation here. It's the ATAS, and it's on the side of the vehicle. And I wouldn't want to be in the back seat running 100 watts, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's pretty good. And you see the roof rack up above? Wow, wouldn't that make a great place to mount that antenna? The answer is no, and we'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, we see antenna mounts like this down low. Uh, the feed point impedance will probably be about 12 ohms, so your radio is going to uh, object to it. And there's a much easier way to get an antenna for high frequency up high where it's going to do much better. Here we see a Jeep mount, and he's got it on the uh, tire rack. And while that's okay, still there's a higher place to get an antenna mounted on a vehicle. So let's take a look. Now, this is good, stake bed of a vehicle got a uh, looks like a uh, hustler antenna up he's got it nice and high and he's uh, ground planed off of the tail of the vehicle not bad at all there's leo of kenwood uh, leo set up and he's got a ham stick on the left hand side he's got it mounted up nice and high and he's got one of those great lip mounts now here's that rack and on the rack we uh, had an antenna that would just not load You'd look at the rack and you'd say, well, wait a minute, the uh, rack uh, has all sorts of grounding to the uh, area below it. But what occurs is, you see the gap between the rack and the top of the vehicle? That creates X of C, capacitive reactance. And that absolutely messes up the feed point impedance. And try as you may, for a high frequency antenna, it will just never load properly no matter how well you ground that rack. Here's another one. It would work for VHF and UHF, but for a high-frequency installation, no, it will not load because of that capacitance between the grounded rack and the ground of the roof itself. Um, here's another one. 
Uh, it just would not load. We took these shots at the Palm Springs Ham Fest, and it was fun to go outside with some of the uh, ham radio operators, look at their mounts, and hear their stories about, well, the antenna's resonant, but the SWR is about two and a half to one. And we can tell you why. This is a VHF mount, but very well could support a lightweight ham stick. And it's up nice and high. There's uh, the famous Outbacker antenna brought in by Don Arnold, W6GPS, many years ago. And that's up nice and high. And uh, that one has a good feed point impedance of about 50 ohms. But if you can't get a good mount up nice and high, you've got to do something about it. This one is not bad. There's not too much any other area they can mount to. But the feed point impedance is probably about 20 to 25 ohms. And the Yezu tied into the ATAS will see a dip, but not a dip strong enough or deep enough to cause that antenna tuner to lock in. And it'll simply hunt and hunt and hunt. Here's another one. Uh, a, a nice installation, good DC ground, but the RF ground has to be right there where the coax attaches to the antenna, probably about 5 to 10 ohms impedance where you need it to be 50. Well, how are you going to get that impedance to 50 ohms? Well, a couple different ways. Some antennas, like the Outbacker, actually have a little bit of matching in the base unit, and uh, this is the uh, famous um, uh, K400 uh, mount. And uh, that mount does a nice job. Uh, you can see the little copper coil at the base of this mount. But again, this whole antenna, and it's a heavy one, off the hitch, nice installation, but you're going to need to do some matching to get the feed point impedance back up to 50 ohms. Now, here's some of the new uh, um, RF um, uh, antennas, the Diamond. And um, it is a, a nice mount. Got it up nice and high. That should work out well without any additional matching necessary. And uh, uh, when we do antenna matching, probably want to stand a little further away, but a good antenna analyzer is a great way to tell uh, what's going on. And uh, this one is not bad because he's got the antenna up fairly high and that coil is uh, well above the metal of the vehicle. Now, when we get to a large coil, this is the high Q antenna, the big five inch coil. Um, antenna needs a lot of bracing to keep it from uh, ripping the trunk off your car. But let me tell you, that decreases the I squared R losses and that will increase your uh, radiation output. And that's what you want is a increase in the radiation resistance. Not the DC. And one way to increase the radiation resistance on any of these high Q antennas is put a capacity hat, but put the capacity hat at least a foot or two above the coil, not right on the coil that we've seen so many times before. Now, here's Don. He's getting ready to uh, punch a hole somewhere in his vehicle. And, of course, um, um, I think he's going to have a... <laughs> a nice little antenna like that. This one has pretty good uh, threads on it and uh, pretty good coil windings. And there's my unit. I've got a roof rack on top, but you won't find any high-frequency antennas on the top. And again, when you go to those skinny little antennas, you're going to lose a lot of energy in the very small coil windings. So if you can, go for a large whip. One that has a lot of surface area. And there's the popular Diamond K400 mount with a 3H24 receiver. And very important on this mount, make sure that each of those four Allen screws go into the metal, not with a little tiny plate they send along with it. That plate would then introduce capacity, and you want a good DC ground. And here you see it, it's well grounded. So make sure you don't use the little plates to buffer between the screws and the uh, body of the uh, trunk. And it's also a good idea to ground the trunk. Well, here's how you bring 20 ohms back up to 50 ohms. And that is with some of the MFJ impedance matching transformer devices. Not horribly expensive. If you don't, you got to run around uh, like this gentleman has. He didn't need that device. And, well, it's a little different way of achieving that 50-ohm feed point. But, hey, to a ham, I like those exposed, exposed coils. Yes, sirree. 
So again, uh-huh. get yourself the impedance matching transformer. This from MFJ, uh, or they have one for capacity. I like the one with inductance, especially if it's rated at a thousand watts. Remember, no base loading on high frequency. 10 meter band is about the only band you can get away with a base loading coil. The rest of the antennas, they want that coil mid shaft or center loaded because base loading, you're going to lose a lot of your energy with antenna current heating up the base. Gordo, uh, in your antenna thing, that was fantastic. There's two things that I find that's very important and amateur radio, and I really mean this. And of course, you expect me to tell you the microphone because it is very important. It all starts at the microphone, and and I got it. I just have to impress upon you: articulation is so important, and all these sports matching microphones, baloney. Uh, they're not matching; they're painted the same color. So you got to get the right microphone for what you're going to want to do. But here's the other one: you have to have one of these. Yeah, and one yeah. of these is so, so important. And, and we have a lot of new hams that are, are watching the show and get their license because of, of, of Ham Nation. But I got to tell you guys and girls, if it, I would buy this before I would buy my radio. And I really yeah. mean that because yeah. you want to build some antennas. You don't need a radio with this. And, and experiment with your antennas, and it tells you exactly what the impedance is. And, and so many people are so fixed on uh, 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 the standing wave ratio, the reflected power. That's important. But the only way to keep that reflected power from coming back is to match that impedance. It's got to be 50 ohms or as close as you can get it. And how else are you going to tell? Your radials are not going to tell you, oh, I got an SWR meter. on. No, it just gives you a, a variable. This gives you the real deal. I tell you, this is an amazing piece that MFJ came up with. It's probably one of the best products that I have ever seen for measuring and keeping antennas together. Now you can go out and you can spend a couple of thousand dollars and buy some commercial ones. Don't have to do that. Uh, this is the baby. But, and, and this is not a commercial. This is an honest to goodness uh, have to for ham radio. You, you've, there are certain things you need to make it work. And uh, Gordo, you agree with that? Yeah, yeah you absolutely agree. With agree. Uh, it, uh, this is a handy piece of equipment at about 300 bucks. But, you know, MFJ makes a $100 one of these for high frequency as well as a $100 one for VHF. Doesn't have as many goodies on it, but by golly, it sure tells you the impedance. And that's what we need to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of our uh, uh, teammates, Randy, uh, went to a ham fest this past weekend up in the um, uh, Sacramento area. So, Brian, if you don't mind, let's take a look and see what uh, Randy spotted for us stuff at a ham fest. The Sierra Foothills Amateur Radio Club presents Ham Fest 2015 and Swap Meet in the old Loomis train depot near Sacramento. It was a wonderful location. The trees were budding open. It was warm, sunny, and lots of room. Carol and Roger were manning the ARL table, and the club members were doing many functions, selling the coffee and donuts, raffle tickets, providing security, and generally helping out everybody who was attending. Thanks a lot to them. Tony was selling raffle tickets in the parking lot, and we had lots of room for everybody to set up. This fellow is checking carefully something he's about to purchase, and this fellow is a professional with his little cart. He's happy with his copper beam and the ghostbusters people were here always look carefully at all the boxes on the ground you never know what you're going to find look at all this old heathkit gear and it's good time to meet up with old friends at the swap meet he has some old code practice machines and a record player i love this tube symbol t-shirt and so does he i don't think she really wanted to be here all morning and again make sure you get your raffle tickets for all the prizes yeah, yeah, some assembly required. And, geez, this what's left of Radio Shack? Crystals, 50 cents each or $10 for the box. A Heathkit two-meter lunchbox. A tailgate of test gear. 
some antennas and meters. Here's some of the equipment I had for sale. And we were watched by drones from overhead. This fellow won a restored Kenwood TS-530. And thanks for all the Ham Nation viewers. It was great to meet a lot of you. And the Sierra Foothills Amateur Radio Club. They put on a very nice event. Photos by Carol, Carl, and Donna. Thanks for watching. Randy K7AG. From new models to classic radios, there's something for everyone this season. So get out or hunker down with ICOM. Celebrate ICOM's 50th year with the IC7850. Only 150 units are available, and each radio features 1.2 kilohertz optimized roofing filter, a new local oscillator design with improved phase noise, several spectrum scope enhancements, and distinct gold accents on the front panel and commemorative label. For contesters just starting out this year, ICOM's IC7600. You get advanced DSP technology and IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Got cabin fever and need to get away? Get mobile with ICOM's IC2730A and ID5100A. The analog 2730A mobile and digital 5100A with built-in GPS. Both feature optional Bluetooth capability for hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF, and the large backlit screen. For entry-level D-Star operation, take the ID888H on the road. Features include a good menu structure and VHF-UHF dual-band functionality, one band at a time. Time. To hunker down or get out, the ID51A Plus is a perfect radio to enjoy global communications. This dual bander has the free downloadable RSMS1A Android app, enhanced DV functionality, and additional D-plus reflector link commands. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM's base stations, mobiles, and portables. And I want you to go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation and check out the uh, contest that we have. Also, you can register for weekly swag and whatnot. And the prize for March is the IC2730A Analog Dual Band Mobile from ICOM. This is a great radio, and I hope you can win it. Boy, isn't that a fine-looking radio? That's a, that's a nice piece of gear right there. icomamerica.com slash hamnation has all the details on how you can uh, enter to win. And, of course, uh, check out the ICOM swag as well, and you can go back and, and look at all of, the, uh, all of the previous winners in the ICOM stuff, and we hope we see your name coming up there soon. Well, now let's, let's segue over to, uh, uh, to Ohio and see what's going on with Dayton. I believe we've got some announcements tonight. And, yes, we do. Very good evening to everybody. My, my name is Jim Teterman, N8IDS. I'm the 2015 Dayton Hamvention General Chairman. To my left is over here, to your right, is Dave Crawford. He is the Chairman of the Awards Committee for the 2015 Dayton Hamvention. And we've got the announcements this evening for the awards winners for our award presentation this year. We're starting up with Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, good evening, everybody on Ham Nation. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, extend my congratulations to all of our award winners. Uh, the first one on the list is the Technical Excellence Award winner, and that is Reverend George Dobbs, G3RJV. George has selfishly led the promotion of the art of self-learning and simple construction projects that <clears throat> of amateur radio communications offer. For over 40 years, he has done it, has been against the backdrop of rapid technology and innovation and commercialization within the field of radio communications. If you go to his website, he has got a ton of stuff. Great for brand new ham starting out. In fact, I saw a crystal radio there that I, I made as a kid. Number two on the list. Thank Jim. you. Thank you, Dave. And next we have the Special Achievements Award, Thomas C. Medlin, W5KUB, a very familiar voice and a very familiar figure at Hamvention. Yeah. Tom is recognized for bringing amateur radio to those that are not able to attend amateur radio events through his podcast at W5KUB.com. It allows everyone to see what is happening in the world of amateur radio and to participate with questions via real-time chat room. He has over 50,000 viewers in over 150 countries. Back over to you today. Um, the next one on the list is uh, Tim Duffy. Uh, Jim, I'm going to let you do that one since he's the uh, Amateur of the Year. Go ahead. Okay. Hello. Taking the spotlight here. Everybody knows, I believe, Tim Duffy, K3LR. Amateur of the Year. Jimmy. 
Go ahead, Bob. Jim is active in many facets of amateur radio since becoming a ham at the age of 12. Tim has been an active member of his local clubs and holding various offices. He moderates forums, has authored articles on antennas, active in contesting, founder of Contest University, provides trains young and old hams in many amateur radio activities, and chairman of the ARRL Contest Advisory Committee and co-founder, co-founder excuse me, of D-Star Day, which promotes instruction and awareness of digital communication systems. Congratulations to Tim for Amateur of the Year. And the last but not least is our Club of the Year. This is a fairly new award. We've only had this about three years. And this year it's going to the Orlando Amateur Radio Club. The members of Orlando Amateur Radio Club have take great pride in planning for the future of amateur radio and preserving the history of technology. We do this by recruiting, training, and helping committed hams to carry on the tradition of amateur radio. They plan and manage ham nation, hamcation, excuse me, one of the premier amateur radio gatherings in the Southwest. They actively support Orange County ARES and Skywarn as well, and several community service agencies. They continually provide conduct and conduct training and testing for all ages. Well done to Orlando Amateur Radio Club. And that rounds out the four amateur uh, categories for this year. Congratulations again to all the winners. We are really looking forward to having them here in Dayton for the presentation on Saturday evening during Hamvention. Any more comments, Dave? No, I just want to thank uh, Ham Nation and all the viewers out there for allowing us to be part of it. We appreciate you being here, but more than that, we appreciate you and all of the DARA members to keep that going. Uh, I don't think anyone realizes how much work and time that takes, and it's all volunteer. I, I don't see how you do it, but thanks for doing it. My first my first ham uh, invention was 1959. I've seen it grow from 600 people into Biltmore to well, 32, 33,000 one year. So uh, congratulations to all of you. We really appreciate you being here and uh, giving us the opportunity to let everybody know who these great winners are. And we're, we're very proud of uh, of Tim Duffy and, and Tom Medlin. My God, they just, they, they do so much for this hobby. And of course, uh, Reverend George, he's, a, he's an institution in the UK and uh, hats off to Orlando. So thanks very much, guys. We're going to see you in a, what, about 55 or so days. So, uh, uh, keep it all open, and uh, we'll be there with our hats on, and uh, everybody will be ready to say hello to Dayton once again. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. And Thank uh, you. Thank you I'm. I, I, I want to head down to see Don. Don, I, I I got this thing, and we can put that antenna <laughs> just where you need. you want yeah. that on the left <laughs> fender or the right <laughs> fender. Which which, which fender is going to work best, Don? <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't know. I tell you what. If we if we cut to if we cut to Gordon, Gordon, if you'll stand up and turn around, I'll tell you which fender I want to. I want Bob uh, to no, drill a hole you. in. Negative. Negative. <laughs> yeah, we're not we're not drilling any holes in that Trans Am. That's for sure. Hey, we have got. It, it's been it's been. Oh, it's, it's been. I wanted to I wanted to say at the top of the show, Gordon. You mentioned Hamfest. There's a good one coming up in Louisiana this weekend. It's the Rain. Ham Fest. It's right around Lafayette. It's the one in Cajun country where they have the Cajun Fado dough and the crawfish boil on Friday night. Uh, but the yep. Ham Fest is on Saturday. And of course, our friends at Maine Trading are going to be there. And uh, uh, our friends from Radio Waves, Emmett, uh, was there last year. Hopefully, he'll be there this year as well. Um, but it's a great Ham Fest, and I'm going. Uh, it's right around Lafayette. It's, it's the Rain Ham Fest. So looking forward to that. So it's a good time. It's the only one I know of that has a crawfish boil. <laughs> there's been some crazy. There's been some crazy things going on on the sun. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a a level G four solar storm. They only go up to five, so this was huge. It was the biggest biggest solar storm of this cycle. And normally we do the newsline report here, but we're not going to do that tonight because we have Dr. Tamitha Scove's full report. And in fact, this this information is so fresh. She was up all night last night looking at aurora from this thing. The aurora went very very far south. Um, we literally just got this report three minutes ago, so I haven't seen it. Uh, we're all going to watch it together, and here is astrophysicist Dr. Tamitha Scove with 
a very important solar report right now. Hi, I'm Tamitha Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of March 19th. Space weather activity has kicked into high gear this week, and it's all due to region 2297. You can see it here. It's kicked off more than 10 M-class flares and an X2.2. You can see it right there. And that X2.2 destroyed amateur radio communication for literally hours. The bands were nothing but static. Now, the region quieted down when it reached center disk. It really wasn't that eruptive. But then you saw this filament here that started getting really unstable that was right next to it. And then it bifurcated and then finally erupted in this dragon snake kind of configuration. It looked like literally a dragon head, as you can see here. And that eruption, along with another filament that erupted, kind of combined in the solar wind. And when it actually reached Earth, it caused a G4-class geomagnetic storm. But more about that in a minute. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, you can see the M-flare started back on March 6th. We had that X2.2 on the 11th, and the flares just kept coming. We almost had an M-flare right here. There's that long-duration M-flare. That's where that dragon snake eruption happened, and that actually caused a proton radiation storm as well from the solar storm that was coming towards Earth, which ended up hammering high latitudes on top of the flares, uh, so it caused problems for GPS navigation and amateur radio operation up until that storm hit Earth. Switching to our solar storm levels, you can see we've been hovering at unsettled to quiet conditions for a number of days, and that included a couple solar storm fizzles that just didn't have the right configuration until, wait for it, Bam! Do you see that right there? That is one of the top five solar storms that have occurred in Solar Cycle 24. This storm was so strong that it absolutely annihilated the ham radio operator bands. It also caused GPS issues. I got a couple people reporting in there. And we have an unconfirmed report of an amateur radio operator getting shocked from his antenna during the storm. And this massive storm caused gorgeous rainbow aurora all over the world, including places like Estonia, and we had gorgeous coronas in Sweden and also in Scotland, gorgeous rainbow aurora in Ireland, and Lancaster, Northumberland, and Cumbria in the UK. We also had gorgeous aurora in Hamburg, Germany, and it reached clear down to France. Now, we also had aurora in Iceland. This is before the storm and during the storm. We also had aurora all over the United States that reached clear down to Colorado, but here's some from uh, Illinois. And then the Aurora Australis, we had New Zealand and also in Perth, Australia. That's incredibly high latitude for Aurora to be seen. This is incidentally also the place where that ham radio operator was reported to get shocked and when we also heard reports of power fluctuations. So what does the sun do for an encore? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our backside monitor. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun from behind. And when you look at the back side of the sun, it's actually quite busy. It's really complicated. We've got region 2290, which is now rotated Earth side. We've renamed that 2303. But you can see there's a lot of other really complicated structures on the back side, but not a lot of, of flare activity. So we don't have any contenders like 2297. We're expecting that we probably are going to be looking more at uh, high-speed wind from coronal streams over the next few days. Returning to the disk, you can see region 2297 is finally rotating off to the west limb. Now, it has diminished somewhat, but it is still an M-flare contender. On top of that, it has finally moved into a position where it actually gives us a higher risk for proton radiation storms, so we can expect uh, the possibility of that to be increasing over the next few days. Now, region 2302 also is beginning to grow rapidly, and it may become a flare contender, but it only has a couple days before it's out of Earth view. Other than that, we only have region 2303, which is coming onto the disk, and it is not really a big player at this time, but we'll be sure to be watching it. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming days, even though we are officially outside a solar storm, we are now under the influence of a high-speed solar wind. What's compounding that is the fact that we're in a magnetic sector that actually has a lot of southward pointing field. And all of this combined is causing this magnetic storm to kind of the effects of it to kind of linger. As a matter of fact, right now we are still in a G2 class solar storm. 
So what NOAA is saying is that we should have about a 45% chance of a major storm at high latitudes over the coming days and about a 30% chance of active conditions at mid latitudes. But that actually might be an underestimate considering these compounding conditions. We might actually see more storming over the next day or two, even at mid latitudes. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming days, NOAA is giving us about a 40% chance for an M-class flare over the next day or so until region 2297 rotates behind the west limb. As far as particle radiation storms are concerned though, we've got about a 30% chance because of the location of where 2297 is. Once it rotates out of sight, that chance will diminish significantly. Now one last thing I'd like to mention is that there is going to be a total solar eclipse of the sun on the 20th. So if you happen to be in Iceland or in Africa or in Eurasia, anywhere you see this shadowed region here, you do have a chance to check it out in person. So don't miss it. So this week has been an absolute buzz of activity. I want to thank amateur radio operator KC7RUN and all of the amateur radio operators out there who have reported into him not only during the X-class flare but also during that huge geomagnetic storm we just finished having. Your tireless efforts are so important to me. I also want to thank all the uh, Aurora photographers and all the field reporters out there who have been reporting into me on Twitter uh, from what they see and what they don't see. Your reports are what make this community so incredibly vibrant and timely, and I am just incredibly honored to be a part of it. Meanwhile, we still have some solar storm lingering issues that may last for the next couple days. So you still could see some GPS, some ham radio issues, and uh, other might even get a chance for more aurora at high latitudes over the coming days. But then take some rest over the weekend because things should be quieting down. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. T. And she's watching, by the way, tonight. I've been uh, talking to her via Twitter during the first half of the show. We were waiting for this to upload. She literally just finished it. And so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sko, for being part of, of, of Ham Radio. This is just so cool. I want you to, you need to follow her on, on Twitter, at Tamitha Scove and spaceweather.tv. Um, if you if you poke around in there, I believe if you go to educational resources, I think if you click on that, there's some neat uh, uh, neat videos. Uh, scroll on down. Yeah, the Carrington comparison, right there. That that compares what we just went through to something that happened in 1856, I believe it was, which was the largest. Uh, thing which is about nine times bigger, I think, than what we had now. Which, if this would have happened today, the care if the Carrington event would have happened today, uh, there could very well have been year-long power outages on the East Coast. Um, satellites uh, would have been pretty much rendered useless. So you need to go go check out the Carrington event. This was just an amazing thing where literally. Uh, telegraphers, this is back in, in the 1850s with, with, uh, with Morse code and the telegraph, they were literally, telegraphers were actually being shocked and sparks were flying from their code keys and actually setting some papers on fire. The, the auroras were so bright as far down as Cuba that people were actually reading the newspaper at night and people were waking up thinking it was daytime in the middle of the night and going out and going to work and then realizing what time it was and saying, what in the hell is going on? So this is, this is just... Go watch this when you when you have time. Uh, the Carrington comparison, just absolutely amazing stuff. So again, uh, Doctor T, we're so happy to have you here, and and I'm just honored to be your friend and and colleague in this. So we're doing our best to educate about solar weather. And another great educator that we have on our team, of course, is is uh, is George Thomas, W five JDX, and Smoke and Solder, and just. We're happy to have you in the family too, George. You're a, you're an asset to uh, to this hobby, that's for sure. How are you tonight? You're looking good. Well, thank you, Don. I am doing pretty well tonight. My uh, my video setup kind of took a dive there, so I'm back on the old webcam from a different angle. I don't think we've ever shot from this angle before, but uh, anyway, another little view of the uh, shack behind me here. You know, this week uh, I built something here that I've had. Oh, and a parts bag ever since I went to, let's see, where did I get this? Pacificon, I believe. No, it wasn't Pacificon. CPAC, one or the other. Anyway, uh, a good many months back, I picked up this little kit right here. This, if I can pronounce it right, is an Iambino. And it's a, a little 
code keyer that you use with an Arduino. So let's just uh, take a look at that video. We're going to build it this week, and then we're going to test it next time. As you know by now, I'm a big fan of the Arduino and some of the different shields that you can use with it, as well as projects you build yourself. This week, I've got a great one for you. It's an iambic keyer shield for the Arduino from David Turnbull, AE9RB. Let's first talk a little bit about what this shield will do. The IMBino iambic keyer shield for the Arduino contains a DAC, an op-amp, and a speaker that can produce sharp sine waves without clicks and harmonics that's loud enough to be heard across the room. It's got a menu-driven interface. It's got two banks of message storage that'll allow you to store up to eight messages up to 111 characters each. There's a speed control that will allow you to adjust the speed of the sending, and you can also choose the mode of iambic, automatic, bug, or straight keying. Now, the first thing David suggests that you do is run a little test on your Arduino to make sure you've got your software set up correctly and you know how to upload sketches to it. It's very important that you upload the iambino software before you actually install the shell on your Arduino. So let's look at what comes in the kit here. We've got a bag here that looks like it's got a couple of chips and sockets and a few transistors in it. A simple little PC board, and all the components are through holes here, so these should be easy to mount. A bag of components, resistors, capacitors, a potentiometer, some jacks, etc. And we've got a little LCD display here. And a little strip of pins here for the Arduino shield. And to start with, David suggests that we do all the resistors first. Once we've mounted them all, we'll solder them all in place. Next, we've got three 0.1 microfarad axial capacitors. We'll mount those as C4, 5, and 6. And as long as we're here, David suggests we also install Q1 through 3. And these are 2N7000 transistors. We need to observe that we've got them in the right direction. You'll notice there's a flat side on the transistor itself. And we match that with the flat side on the silk screen. And we can take a moment here just to check and make sure we've got no solder bridges. Next, we'll install the two IC sockets and the trimmer potentiometer R12. And after that, we need to break up these pins into groups so that we can solder them to the PC board. We're going to need two 8-pin groups, two 6-pin, and one 2-pin connector. And so it looks like we're going to have six pins left over here. Now, to install these connectors, we've got to make sure that they're perfectly perpendicular to the Arduino or they're not going to go in. Now the easiest way to do this is going to be take the pins, plug them into the Arduino, and then line it up on top so that everything lines up perfectly straight. And when you solder this, be careful you don't get these too hot and melt the plastic connectors down there. All I'm actually going to do is the ones on the ends here. And then I'll go back and do the others after I've removed it from the Arduino. Okay, they all look perfectly straight there. And now the four push buttons, and push buttons one through four are all black ones, and the fifth one is red. You need to be careful when you're putting them in. You can line them up, and there's only one way that the holes really line up with the pins. Now, we need to be careful here because switch S1 is located right above the Arduino power jack. And we need to trim the leads there just so it will sit down okay. And looks like that did the trick. And now we need to install the jacks onto the PC board here. And next is 16-pin socket here for the LCD display. Now when we put it together, we need to be sure that the leads on the bottom of the socket here aren't going to touch anything in the Arduino, particularly those pins right there. And looks like we've got good clearance on mine here, so I won't need to trim those. Next, what he says is the most difficult part, which is soldering the speaker on which essentially uh, this is the speaker we just solder it to those two posts right there i guess that could be difficult there's a sticker here on the end of it says remove after washing well i think that's if you're washing the pc board which we're not <laughs> going to do so we'll remove it now otherwise you wouldn't hear any sound coming out of there and then we've got the only ceramic disc capacitor in the kit 
And that really doesn't look like a ceramic disc to me, but it is. So let's install it. This is C7. And then we've got three 10 microfarad capacitors here, C1, 2, and 3. They're polarized, of course. The negative side is marked here, so we want to be sure we don't put it in the positive hole. And now we're almost done. We've got R13 here, the speed potentiometer. And then the two ICs. IC1 is the MCP4921. So we'll install it, being careful we get the polarity right. There's a little notch on this end of the IC socket. There's a little notch on the chip itself, so we line those two up. And then IC2 is a TS922, same deal. Little notch on the chip here, and match it up with a little notch on the socket. And now to install the LCD display, we've got a 16-pin connector here. We'll plug that into the socket on the board. Then we'll set the LCD display on top of that, and it will just fit in there, and you'll notice that it leans a little forward, and it kind of rests on top of an IC in there, and on top of a jack here. According to the author, we should leave it that way. We should not try to straighten it up. And there you go. We're done. There's a couple of tests we should make with this before we try to use it, and that's where we'll pick up next time. Well, there you go, the, I think you pronounce it, I am Bino. And, yeah, we're going to look at it next time. I actually played with it a little bit. And um, a couple of unusual uh, things in my experimenting with it there that we'll talk about it. But it is a great little project, and it does work just fine. Uh, it's be a lot of fun if you work a lot of CW. And uh, we'll just go over it better next, uh, next time we get together and talk about that some. But right now... I've got a contest, and as a matter of fact, what we're going to give away is sitting back there on the table behind me because I didn't grab it when I moved up here real quick. But what we're going to give away is a set of Heil Pro Set 3s, uh, you know, oh. the great stereo earphones from Bob. Does anybody have a set of Pro Set 3s handy there? Yeah, Gordo does. I love them. Oh, yeah, yeah, nice headsets. Anyway, we've got a set here. Not, that's it. We're not giving away mine, and we're not giving away Bob's or Gordo's. We've got a fresh pair we're giving away. And if you'd like to win that, then I've got a question here, and Don's got them too. That's not the way they go, Don. <laughs> anyway, uh, the technician exam has got a question on there. It's, what type of component is often used to adjust volume control or to, is used as an adjustable volume control? A, a fixed resistor. B, a power resistor, C, a potentiometer, or D, a transformer. And if you think you know the answer to that, send your answer to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you might win a pair of those Heil Pro Set 3s. Great set of headsets. You can see, no, Don, it, uh, th that's just not uh -huh. the way it goes. No. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to Don now. If he can get his headphones on straight, I think he's got a message for us from DX Engineering. <laughs> Those are great headphones, by the way, but they don't work worth the crap when they're that way. Um, let, me, let me talk to you about DX Engineering. If, children, if we get our textbooks out and we turn to page 66 and 67, you know what we see? We see more books because that's what we're going to talk about tonight. You need to expand your ham radio knowledge. And any good ham radio operator is always reading, learning, growing. And DX Engineering will add to that. There are a ton of books, technical manuals, instructional videos, reference guides, and they're all there to help you become a better ham radio operator. These come from trusted sources, AWRL, Ward Silver, Bob Alfin, many, many more. And just a taste of what you'll find right now at DXEngineering.com, AWRL Literature, the go-to for ham radio reference material. An amazing selection of titles you can enjoy. Uh, operators by, of any skill level will find something uh, for them in here. A huge range of topics, antenna building, digital modes, everything in between. And they also, the NRL, as you know, the annual handbook, the operating manual, and the repeater directory. I have to get a repeater guide every year. It's just, it's just one of those things. You just have to do it. And DX Engineering carries only the most up-to-date editions. Now, 
Uh, if you want something that's a little more advanced, you might want to check out the uh, Champion Radio books. They're authored by Ward Silver, N0AX, and Steve Morris, KL7, I'm sorry, K7LXC. Check that. Uh, two authors rigorously examine and, and test popular HF antenna designs. Uh, DX Engineering's Butternut Verticals are in there as well. These are books are must-reads for any ham interested in buying, building, or experimenting with vertical <laughs> antennas. Up the Tower is a great one from Steve Morris. Has everything you need to know before you stick a shovel in the ground. Exclusive behind-the-scenes stories from some of the most exotic D expeditions with videos from Bob Alfin, K4UEE. And you uh, you saw Bob Alfin uh, at... Um, at Navasa, at K1N. So uh, these are experts in the field. The eight DVDs in the series illustrate the funny, interesting, and sometimes scary situations that uh, the expedition teams encounter on their adventures. They're an excellent addition to club library. Makes for a great movie night, too, either at home or for the club. Uh, each one highlights a particular D expedition, um, HK0NA, Malpelo Island in 2012, Guinea, West Africa in 07, K5K Kingman in uh, 2002. And also, Bob has uh, compiled a DVD that includes nine D expeditions to the DXCC's 10 most wanted list. You have got to see that. And there's a whole lot more at DX Engineering, and it's all there. And they ship faster than anyone else in the industry. Get your order in by 10 p.m. Eastern tonight. And if it's in stock, it will leave on a truck tonight headed your way. Proven products, expert advice, DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. Grab your catalog, shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com. Slash Ham Nation. DX Engineering, thank you so much for everything you do for Ham Nation. We are just uh, tickled as we can possibly be uh, to uh, to be part of of, uh, of DX Engineering. And I've completely lost my rundown now. I've uh, clicked around and, and killed it, and I don't know where we are. So someone needs to pick this thing up because I've just... Oh, it's it's time for Val. That's right. Speaking of DX, hi, darling. How you doing? Good. How you doing, Don? Oh, Hello, man, everybody. Man. Well, you know what? I'm going to start us off with, I have in my possession an audio recording from Jerry's radio when he was on Navassa. So I thought you guys might be interested to hear exactly what it sounds like on the other side of a pileup from a top 10 D expedition. So get your pens and papers ready. See if you can hear some of the signals Jerry's picking out and, and, You'll understand now on these de-expeditions why they sometimes have such a wide split. And you can even hear them tune in the bands trying to pick out one signal. And uh, it's pretty interesting. I also just threw some uh, K1N photos on there as well to keep you entertained if you don't want to try and listen to that pileup. But uh, if you want to go ahead and play that, uh, here's what it sounds like on the other end. Now, Gulf Shore, Charlie, Alpha, Mexico. Thank you for your patience. Five nine. Okay, thank you. Now, who's the Oscar Hotel Six? Oscar Hotel Six. Okay, Oscar Hotel Six. Something. Oscar Hotel 6, Germany, America, Zulu, 5-9. Oscar Hotel 6, Golf Alpha, Zulu, 5-9. Thank you, QRZ, uh, Kilo 1, Nevada. in Zulu. QR set, Kilo 1 Nevada, listening down. Okay, V3 Radio Fox Alpha, 5 9. Thank you, QR set, listening down. Radio Alpha 1 Oscar Whiskey, 5 9. Yeah, Radio Alpha 1 Oscar Whiskey, 5 9. Thank you, listening down. Alvo 5, Tango United, Foxtrot. 
So what do you think of that? It's pretty amazing to hear the other end of the pileup. And look who I finally talked into joining me on the show, Jerry WB9Z. Welcome. I'm happy to be Jay. here. All right. Hi, Bob. Yay, Jerry. <laughs> All right. So um, he's just coming off. For those of you who don't know, he's just came back from Nevada K1N. And uh, before we uh, go into some of the questions we're going to be asking him, I wanted to show this next slide, if you want to put that up, Ryan. Those are all the de the major de-expeditions that Jerry has been on. And if you notice, some of them have little gold stars in the right-hand corner. Those have all won de-expedition of the year. So um, welcome again. And out of, I know you just came off of Nevada, so... Out of all these on Nevada, do you have anything interesting or fun stories you want to share with everybody? Well, I was uh, I had the honor of um, being uh, the f on the first helicopter flight in, and I was on the last helicopter flight out, so it gave me plenty of time to uh, personally make over 19,000 contacts myself. Um, I was the first uh, AM operator on top of the lighthouse in 22 years, um, I was uh, um, able to install or hang the American flag pretty close to the top, not on the top. It wasn't safe to get all the way to the top, but it was still at uh, about 160 feet. And um, I also, uh, what I remember about Navassa, the last day when we left, we were able to uh, give these uh, poor Haitian fishermen all of our leftover water, uh, gasoline, our uh, leftover food. Uh, we gave them uh, shoes, sandals. Um, I gave this guy here a uh, my coffee cup, and a, about a few minutes later, he's running around with the the cup hanging around his neck. So I think he was just making sure that nobody uh, you know stole it from him. That prize possession, that three dollar plastic cup. That was it was it was really cool. Given these uh, these these Haitians didn't even have, most of them didn't even have shoes, so that was that was a big thing to them to get uh, you know our leftover flip flops and sandals and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of cool. Well, I know you've been on a lot of de expeditions, and so a lot of people out there. I'm I know you guys who have the big antenna farms and a lot of power. I uh, usually don't have trouble busting these kind of pileups. So I'm going to ask, how does a little guy get through to you? Uh, the guy with 100 watts and a wire, how does he break some of these monster pileups? Well, it's interesting. Um, I had guys later on in the expedition come on after I, you know, worked them and I acknowledged them. They said they were running five watts, um, two watts, one watt. I think one European even said he was uh, running one half of a watt. I had guys tell me they were using indoor wire antennas. And the trick is to find a clear spot in that pileup and call there and you can always listen on your transmit frequency and a trick that I get and and tell people to call if they can't get through go to the top of the pileup and call up there sometimes when I'm just I can't get anything I'll go to the top of a pileup and usually I get this one guy that's you know out there all by himself above everybody and that sometimes you know works for me so like if you say you're listening on 14.240 through 14.250, he can kind of probably go up to 251 or 252. Exactly, exactly. Um, right. It's not always written in stone where we're listening, uh, the, the edges. So uh, lots of times it helps to be on the edges, even on the lower edge. All right. So there you go. There's your secret to getting through for you uh, little pistols out there. Um, now, uh, for those of uh, out there who want to get on a de-expedition, how do you go about getting on a major de-expedition? Well, it's always, you know, helps to have uh, free time. And most of these expeditions take a minimum of two to three weeks. Um, I've been, the longest one I was on was seven weeks. So you got to have time. You got to have um, money. Um, you got to have, the best thing is to have contesting experience. Um, I've been contesting for over 40 years. Um, 
all of the major de-expedition leaders, you know, know me. And I went down to PJ2T on Curacao 16 times um, in the early days. And I got to figure out how to run stations fast in a contest. And uh, that always helps too. Um, so, and then it also helps to have a specialty. Um, it, you can be a, like a, a specialist in computers and IT. That's a big plus. Um, a power generator type guy is also in, in great demand. Um, How about a doctor too? Oh, do <laughs> doctors are always big in demand. It's always, we always, you always want to have a minimum of one doctor. I've been on expeditions with three doctors and it's, it's, you know, it makes you feel really safe that way. Um, because, you know, we're, we're days, lots of times days and, um, and, and weeks away from civilization. Um, and somebody that knows how to, you know, fix radios, uh, um, a real good uh, uh, technician type guy is, is really helpful too. So you got to learn those pileups by contesting. You got to have a special skill um, a, a, or a specialty. And uh, so, what, what, so what makes a successful de-expedition? All of those. And then you also have to be able to get along with everybody. Um, I have never been on an expedition where there was any fights. Um, I've heard of fights, but I've never been on one. Everyone that I've been with is everybody gets along well. And you have to under stress because these expeditions are very stressful and they're hard on the body, lack of sleep. And that's the last thing you want is a hothead on a, on a major expedition. Also, I do want to mention we are going to be around uh, for the chat room portion. So if you have any questions for Jerry, make sure you let Amanda know in the chat room. Um, also, I'm going to just ask you some really quick questions if you would just want to answer them. Um, out of all your de expeditions, which one had the worst terrain? Oh, that's easy. That was Malpelo. And uh, Don was just talking about that uh, Malpelo out in the uh, um, Pacific Ocean off of Columbia, HK0NA. That's a 900-foot rock that comes out of the uh, Pacific um, and then almost goes straight up. Um, that by far was was the, 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 the worst terrain. How about the worst temperatures? Uh, that was Malpelo and then Swains Island. Um, both of those, it was 110, as high as 120 degrees during the hottest part of the day. I think even uh, on Swains, we saw it uh, in excess of 120 degrees. I can't imagine that with humidity and sitting in a chair, probably a metal, uncomfortable chair operating for hours on end. Um, which one was the hardest one to get to for you? I know some of these places are pretty remote. Um, that's that's a good question, Val. Um, I think that's probably South Orkney. Uh, we had to cross the uh, Drake Passage, which is some of the wildest seas in the world for five days. Um, so that's from the bottom of South America to the Antarctic. Um, and... Uh, also, the, um, the last trip uh, to the uh, southern Indian Ocean, uh, we made uh, FT5ZM on Amsterdam Island. Uh, that took nine days uh, one way, and uh, that was about half of that trip was rough. So I bet you get to see some pretty cool wildlife on these de expeditions. Uh, what what were some of the cool stuff you saw? Oh, not bars or things like that. I'm talking about... The animal kind. Animals, uh, <laughs> you know, seals and um, penguins on uh, South Orkney was probably the uh, the most interesting. Now, in all your travels, you get to see people in other countries and things like that. Who provided the best hospitality? Where would you Where would you say? Well, on the uh, Amsterdam Island trip a little over a year ago, the uh, VK sixes in Western Australia, um, the uh, 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 the Perth Radio Club, those guys uh, uh, threw us a barbecue on the way out and one on the way back in. They were super helpful. They helped us out with tower sections for the ep expedition. And then when we got to Amsterdam, there was um, uh, a group of 20 French uh, researchers and scientists. And uh, they took really good care of us, fed us well. And uh, I think that was probably the, uh, the best part of that expedition was the, uh, the French food. So what was your most exciting memory from all your de-expedition? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one to, uh, to pick out. Probably the, um, the uh, 
Odessa Cheo, K5D, Bob Alfin, K4UEE, let me start the, uh, the phone or the sideband uh, portion of that expedition, uh, and they turned me loose for the first three or four hours, and uh, that was probably the most memorable. Uh, that was rank, rank number five, I think, at the time, and uh, that, was, uh, that was pretty wild for the first, uh, first four or five hours. All right. Well, speaking of Bob Elfin, I'm going to ask you what I asked him. Why do you do this? Oh, uh, that's that's another tough question. Um, sometimes I wonder, but you know, it's all about the adventure. Um, <laughs> it's about the uh, you know the friendships you make with all of these guys you travel with. Um, you know, I got friends for uh, for a lifetime, um, and it's it's. The pileups are great, uh, but it's 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 really good being part of something special. Very cool. All right, and that's it. He's going to be around for chat room questions. Also, if any of you guys on the show have questions for him too, but uh, I just want to let you know on upcoming DX, we have the Democratic Republic of Congo that's going on right now. Also, Malawi's on, and contesting. We got a real big one coming up, not this weekend, but the following weekend, the last weekend in March, and that is the WPX sideband contest we actually won that one last year but we're going to be on vacation so we're not playing so that that position's open for a win if you guys want to get in there wpx talks about your prefix it's all the letters before your number and including the number so every new one combination of that counts as a multiplier so it's a pretty fun contest and there's lots of multipliers in that contest and that's all for us for now and i'll head it over to you don hey, thank thanks. you hey, awesome thanks stuff. Very much. I, I, I want to pick this up one minute. I, I, I cannot, there's not words to describe uh, how we all feel about this operation. You guys are amazing. And Jerry, thanks so much for being on with us and explaining to some of the people that really don't realize what an extent that you have to go through to make this happen. And uh, you, you take a chunk out of your life, and we appreciate that. We is all of amateur radio. And, and I want to tell you one thing, and that I, I think that a lot of people will uh, get something from this. I heard you on, I listened a lot. And when, one night I heard you, and I, I was barefoot. I have a recording of, uh, of this. I was barefoot. And I heard you calling for Japan. Well, you were working a lot, the, 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 all the big pileup. Then you said, I'm listening for Japan only, uh, 240 to 250 to whatever. And so you called about three times, no Japan, no Japan. And so I'm sitting up right in the middle of it, and I'm just waiting. And you came back and said, everyone. And when you did that, I happened to, to get you because you there wasn't a big pile up at the time. And I got right at the end of when you were calling Japan. So it was really cool to work you. I have to tell you that. And I personally appreciate all that you and Bob and, and, and all of the guys. It, it was amazing uh, for this operation. And we were glad to be a part of it. Look forward to seeing you at Visalia. So where's your next one? Um, I, I can't say right now, Bob, it's uh, kind of a secret, but it is in the top 10 and it will be an early 2016. And Bob, it was really great to uh, say hello to you. I think I, I talked to you at least twice, didn't I, uh, from Nevada? One time was on 80 meters sideband. So, um, yep. I think I worked you twice, didn't I? Yes. Uh-huh. And, and in both times, I used that same deal. You would be calling a certain uh, country or a certain division, whatever, and I'd wait. And if, you, if they didn't answer, I knew you were going to go open it up. And that's another thing that you can do. And yeah, I could have turned all the amplifiers on and all that, but I just thought it would be fun to do that, and it worked. So I have something to tell all of the, the hams that have not worked and say, oh, I don't have all that power. You don't need all that power. So um, thanks very much. I look forward to, to being in, uh, in uh, if I say all you with you guys and we'll go get a hamburger together or whatever. So Don, uh, are you, uh, you ready to work them again, Don? What, what are you doing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of hooked. I, I got Navasa on, I don't know, it was like a seventh or eighth call. And I'm one of those guys with 100 watts and a wire too. In fact, uh, I, I, use, uh, I use a special kind of wire and I have both barbed 
and hay. <laughs> so it's it's a multi mode it's a multi mode antenna because I have both the barbed wire and the hay wire. Um, <laughs> actually, most of the hay wire is all right in here. Why don't we Why don't we go and see what Amanda's uh, doing in the chat room? I'm sure she has some some questions for Jerry. Hey, you guys. Yeah. Do I ever have some questions? I'll tell you what. Um, first, I, I had promised I would do this. So to our down under crowd in Australia, thank you so much for watching Ham Nation. And that goes for all of our international viewers. We really appreciate you guys rebroadcasting to make sure you all get to watch us. And a big, big thanks to Don vk 4 TVD. Appreciate you uh, always being um, a, a viewer. So Jerry, really nice to have you on tonight got a lot of questions here. So one of the first ones is kind of a help question from the K1N expedition. And that is, he's wondering, his his uh, contact with you shows up in Club Log, but has not showed up on LOTW. Do you have any news um, about when those are going to be uploaded? Um, n no, I really don't. I probably should <laughs> stay on top of that. Um, but it probably will be a while yet. Um, I'm guessing another few months. Um, they want to take care of everybody that uh, wants to do OQRS. Um, so it's probably going to be a bit yet. Okay, thanks uh, for your info there. The next question I have is from VE3MIC Mike in um, Canada. And he said he noticed during the video that Val showed a couple weeks ago on the K1D expedition that there was some security staff. Is that typical on the expeditions? Um, it was on, on that one. On K5D, Desert Trail, it was. And uh, it was just part of the... Uh, the um, um, yeah, it was part of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and it was... It was it was, it's kind of a long, lengthy uh, thing, and I don't know if I should uh, actually, you know, get into it here, but uh, it, it was a part of our, our contract. Uh, we had to have those uh, those people with us, and actually, there were fish and wildlife agents and biologists and stuff too. And and I was glad they were there. They were super people to work with. As a matter of fact, I think three of the guys that were with us on Navassa were with us on uh, on Desicheo. So it was it was really good and. Uh, they were they were there for our protection. Let's just put it that way. And it's you know it's kind of kind of kind of wild down there in that part of the uh, of the uh, the world. And uh, and they just wanted to make sure we were uh, going to be safe. I could completely understand. I saw that lighthouse um, with the graffiti, and that brings me to um, our next question. We kind of saw what your living conditions were like looking at you guys living in a lighthouse. But can you run it down for us? What were the conditions really like? Well, after we got uh, things cleaned up, we actually lived in the lighthouse keeper, the, the old lighthouse keeper's house. That's hard to say. Um, it had no roof, no windows, so we set up our sleeping shelters in, you know, in, in inside there. So you had to clean up a lot. But we had to we had to cut trees out of there and shovel all kinds of uh, crap out of there. And the lighthouse was that way. The uh, the small other we called it the gas house. That was um, was the same way. We had, you know we had, we had to shovel shovel out years and years of accumulation. There was like four inches of rust that had fallen off the stairs in the lighthouse keepers uh, or the, in the lighthouse. Uh, we just had to you know shovel all that out and sweep it out so we could you know have have clean conditions for the radios and the operating. Although while you were operating, rust was falling on you and into the keyboards and things like that as well, right? Right. And then we put a tarp up over the over the equipment just to keep the rust from falling on onto the equipment. <laughs> that's that's crazy. And I, I do remember also seeing a picture where it was what, hundred and twelve degrees or something. I don't I don't know how you do it, Jerry. You are you are quite astounding when it comes to that stuff, <laughs> all of you guys. And uh, next question, and this is kind of an operating thing. Um, so somebody wanted to know, how come you guys don't run by the numbers when you're working the U.S.? Would that make it easier? Does it make it harder? It obviously does since you don't do it, right? Um, it's, it's not because of speed or convenience. It's because people get out of control, um, they don't like the weight. They have. They don't have 
a lot of people don't have good discipline. So if you or manners you, or manners, <laughs> there you go. So so if you miss them and you go to the next number, then they get mad and they'll jam on your you know on your transmit frequency, and it's just best to give everybody an equal chance. That's that's a wonderful explanation. Thank you so much. I never thought of it that way about, oh, I just turned on my radio and now they've just passed the ones and I have to wait another hour. So that's that's wonderful there. And Bob asked the next question, which was, where to next? Um, so with that, you guys, I only have a group question. Val and Jerry, we love you so much. You guys work so hard during the contesting, but we've got to know, how did you guys meet? Val, do you want to answer that? Oh, how did we meet? Um, yeah. I originally, um, I went to my first DX convention in Chicago. I had just started DXing. I had gotten uh, my first amp and I got hooked on DXing. So I just, someone told me about this DX convention in Chicago. It was only an hour away. So he was there and I met him in the hospitality suite he had just come back mm -hmm. from South Orkney. And um, so I talked to him about South Orkney and the penguins and the seals and pe all that stuff. And uh, probably two mo one month later, I decided to do my first contest. And I decided to do a CQ Worldwide Sideband. And I thought, I'll do 10 meters only. That way I can sleep and take a shower and be a normal person. Because 10 meters shuts down at night. And um, not go 48 hours straight through the contest. And he was doing 10 meters only. And I stumbled onto his frequency. I was operating low power up in Wisconsin. He was operating from here. And he asked me to hold his frequency for him. And that was it. <laughs> that is so awesome. I don't, that's got to be the most original story ever. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> it's Best so pickup line ever. Yeah. So Would you hold my frequency for me? No. It was a really good no. frequency. It was very low in the band on 10 meters. Uh, and I have that, gone that is really cute. Like yeah. Hours. <laughs> oh Jerry, I, I, want to, I want to tell you one thing publicly. Coming from a guy that uh, after many years met his soulmate, uh, you guys are it. I'm, I'm telling you. I am so proud and happy that you got together. It's going to be a great life there. And who knows where contesting and DX is going to go with you two guys uh, out there uh, guiding the ship. So thanks so much. And we appreciate your continuous support of, of Ham Nation. And uh, we'll be there to support you guys as much as we can. But uh, I know you got to have a great feeling to sit beside uh, the person that's uh, on your right, Jerry. You're right. You're right, Bob. And thank you so much. And we have so much fun contesting together. That ARRLDX contest, we had a blast. Yeah, That's great. That's great. Two. Well, Amanda, you uh, uh, you probably have about 400 questions left, but we're already oh. over time. But that's OK. I planned it this way because it was a very special night with Jerry and, uh, and Valerie here. and uh, Everything else was great tonight. So. We're going to have to wind it up uh, because the generator runs out of gas in Petaluma in 10 minutes. <laughs> so we better, uh, uh, better rank it up here and see what happens. And thanks to the chat room for all of your participation tonight. Brian, you did a stellar job. And George, I hope you're feeling good. I uh, really appreciate uh, seeing you again. I know that you've... Uh, been gone a little bit and I hope it's all okay. So I'm going to head off. 20 meters is open. I didn't think we'd have any good propagation, but we do. So thanks to everybody for being here. We're happy to have the Dayton Awards uh, up and on the, uh, the board. So we'll see all of you next week right back here. And I appreciate your time and I appreciate your continued support of Ham Nation. And don't forget to go to the, the twit.tv slash survey and take that survey. Please do that. It means a lot to Leo Laporte and all that to make this show happening. So 7-3, everybody. Best regards, and we'll see you next week back here, if not over here on one of those, uh, those boxes that's got speakers and microphones in them. This is K9EID. Bye-bye for now. Bye.